Want to become an AI trailblazer in the product world? Pragmatic Institute's newest workshop, AI for Product Professionals, is your ticket to generative AI mastery. In this hands-on training, learn to master chat GPT and prompt engineering to transform your product strategies, rapidly create content, optimize workflows, and make razor-sharp product decisions fueled by data. Don't just keep up with the AI revolution. Lead it. Seats are limited. Enroll today at pragmaticinstitute.com slash AI workshop. Hello, and welcome to the Pragmatic Product Chat Series, where we tackle the biggest challenges facing today's product management, product marketing, and other market and data-driven professionals with some of the best minds in the industry. I'm Rebecca Calajaris at Pragmatic Institute and your host for this episode. Today, I am pleased to introduce to this show Josie Borman. Josie is a firm believer in the power of quality education and has dedicated her entire career to equity and access in that field. This journey over the past 25 years has taken her from being a high school social studies teacher to a product and content development executive in ed tech. She is tough but fair, a daring people first leader, and is known for having the courage to take informed risks. And I know all of that last part firsthand, as I have had the distinct pleasure of working with one of her protégés, which is how I actually got introduced to Josie. So welcome, Josie. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Excellent. All right. So I kind of like to start with everybody's like origin story. So if your superhero power is product, which we know it is, right? Sort of how did you get into that? I mean, we talked about your education, passion. How did that morph into sort of the product space? Yeah, absolutely. It actually happened on accident, which is kind of weird. As you mentioned, I was a high school social studies teacher and I absolutely loved it. I lived outside of the Washington, D.C. area and had a passion for working with young people. I worked at an at-risk school and just fell in love with teaching. My husband and I decided though to have a little adventure and we landed in Phoenix, Arizona, which is maybe a podcast for another time and another topic. And I said, <laughs> it'd be great, I'll give you five years. It's been 19, all good, love it. But I accidentally landed in a position where I was working for Pearson. I really wanted to kind of wait to get the right teaching job. And my husband said, let's just have you get a part-time job and we'll figure something out. Right. So I worked for Pearson and their purely digital business at the time. This is when Pearson was the largest publishing company in the world back in 2004. And I was doing digital alignments and I moved into writing content for one of their flagship products. And I found it fascinating because I worked on a product that was for credit recovery. So for the type of student that I was already teaching, and I thought, oh my gosh, wait a minute, what is this ed tech thing that's happening in this Mm. world? I mean, we use technology, but it was like, you know, it was a PowerPoint and it was creating animations in a PowerPoint. And that was the ooh and ah of the business. (laughs) So I started writing content, doing alignments work in a digital way. I started to really think about and get really curious about how are we delivering our learning solutions and our instruction to our end users so that we have students in credit recovery who just can't be in a mainstream classroom for whatever reason, but really give them the opportunity to learn and grow, graduate from high school and go on and do their next best thing. Mm. It was truly an accident and that's how it began. So as I worked for Pearson for 10 years and within that time frame, you know, there are ebbs and flows to yep. development cycles. And during my more of what I would call downtime, which is not really downtime, but kind of, I started to get really curious about how other things worked other than writing the content, designing it, working with the design team and that kind of thing. And this is when Agile started to become like the buzzword. What is Agile? What is Scrum? What does this mean? We were getting ready to launch a new initiative for middle school. And I thought to myself, ooh, wouldn't it be cool if we can use Agile methodologies for content development. Hmm. And as we know, content development, oftentimes you have to really plan in advance. We all know this, but I kind of got curious about how could we plan in advance and have an idea of what the end outcome would be, but be able to break the work down into smaller pieces and deliver and learn without Hmm. breaking the instructional value or the efficacy. 
of what we're trying to do. So I asked, I said, I want to go and I want to be trained. Let me learn. Let me come back and let me learn and let me come back and teach the team how to do the thing. And at one point somebody said, well, it can't be done. <laughs> it's always my favorite challenge. I'm like, oh, yeah. really? That's, the, oh, it can't? Oh, let, hold my beer. Well, let's talk about it. <laughs> and that's the story I like to tell because that's how I remember it. I'm sure that it wasn't exactly <laughs> like that. But, you know, I, have, I do have a little bit of sass. So I did. They let me go and be trained and, and just get curious about how this would work. And over time, and it wasn't easy, we were really able to change the way we thought about how we develop content. How do we work with our partners, whether internally or with external partners on I'm thinking differently about this waterfall approach and really make this Kaizen, right? This incremental improvements, continuous improvements. Eventually, I moved into being a product owner for software development and had the same philosophy. Even though they were doing Scrum, were you really? Do you have the freedom to make recommendations and suggestions mm -hmm. about how we, you know, how we make improvements and so on? And I've been there ever since. And I just fell in love with the product management and product development piece. And where I started to develop my superpower is really hearing and understanding what those customers' needs are, what the unmet need is. Customers don't know what they want. We love them. We mm -hmm. know them, right? We want to give them what they need. So we have to hear them and we, then we have to translate. And then moving it into a development cycle. But really what I love to do is take that, all of those pieces and bring it into education technology where we really bridge the gap between content development and technology and really marry those two concepts together so one doesn't get too ahead of the other. And that's how I became what I am, I guess. <laughs> yeah. No. And what one of the things I love about your story and your approach is I think what you do in every aspect is really marry the strengths and skills and understanding of, of your teaching background and your understanding of software development. Now, it sounds like, well, of course she does, Rebecca. She's an ed tech. But I don't, I don't mean that. I don't mean the field you're in. I mean the expertise. You talk about why it's so important to be customer driven and I really understand your customers and they may not be able to go. And that immediately makes me think about teaching, right? And understanding each student and where they come from because you cannot teach them all the same, right? Like there is a place where I can see the skills and the reasons that you became a teacher make serve you so well in products. And one of the places I want to kind of dive in with you on is leadership, right? Like how are the similarities and sort of similarities or differences between like, you know, you're leading in front of the classroom as a teacher. What did you bring to that then as you're a leader of product teams? And kind of if you were to go backwards into being teaching, not, not backwards, that sounds terrible. If you were going to go back into teaching, it's not backwards. <laughs> <What's> <laughs> um, not backwards. What might you take with you that you've learned as a, as a leader in this sort of development space? A great question, it, an almost easy one to answer, and yet not at all. <laughs> it's one of those things where it's like, here's where I'm going to tell you where I've had some success, and here's where I fall on my face, and all of which is necessary in order for us mm -hmm. to grow. So in leadership, just as with teaching, to your point, you have to know that your audience is not a one-size-fits-all, right? Your peers, the people you report to, potentially the board that you serve under, who is just investing in your creativity and your knowledge. And then of course, the people who work for you. Then there's the people who work next to you and then the other groups that really, mm. in, that you have to feed off of and you have to have this, you know, really close rapport with. My philosophy on leadership is leadership is not about management. It's not about a title. It's not about your role at all. It's about who you are and what you bring to the table. Mm. You can be a leader and be a single contributor at the executive level. You can be a leader and be a single contributor or a teammate at the most entry level. What it takes is really understanding that it's not a one size fits all philosophy. Just like in any classroom, you know, groups and organizations have personalities. I remember my first year teaching, I would have one group that was just funny and, and interesting and there was cracking jokes, but they knew when to crack the joke. And then when I said, mm. okay, it is time, they knew when to settle in and start the work. And they were very talkative and they loved collaborative work and that kind of thing. I literally went to the next period and it was, I went from having 24 kids in a class to 12. And those 12 kids could not be more different from different mm. backgrounds. They could not imagine collaborating with one another because their differences were so great. 
well, how do you go from that 25 really exciting group to the most quiet, calm, almost dark <laughs> group, yeah. right? Yeah. You have to learn about the dynamic of the team. You have to learn about the, those who you're going to be able to influence very quickly and those who are going to take longer to believe in you and mm. believe and trust that what your ideation and your strategies and your hopes and for what we are going to do as a group that we are going to get there together if you trust so that I'm going to carry you along the way or we're going to carry each other along the way. You will always have the onesie twosies and it doesn't matter what you do. They're just not going to believe you. And that's where the interesting piece comes in because guaranteed for those who are the ones who are the most difficult to align with, to get buy-in, to get to understand where you're going, those are the ones that if you can connect with in a really meaningful way and create the common language and work together to kind of see this bigger picture, if you can make it happen, they are the ones who are going to be your biggest advocates. So it's very, very similar to a classroom that you would see in a team. So my philosophy is I'm a people first leader. My philosophy is to build the relationships. And the more and cl more closely you build that rapport with the team, whether it's in an individual, a small group, or as a team as a whole, the more success you will have. And I've been really successful in that way. And I've used what I like to call, you know, my personality, right? You know, hey, everybody. <laughs> so here's the, here's the interesting thing. No, not everybody loves this type of personality, yeah. right? I know it's <laughs> a surprise. One of the greatest lessons I've learned and probably the most painful is sometimes who you are as a leader, what personality you bring to the table, your approach, the ways in which you've learned from the past, you want to implement and grow in the future. Sometimes it doesn't really matter what your leadership style is. You may not be right for that team or that organization. Mm. Conversely, the organization or that team may not be right for you. And that's a really hard lesson to learn. Mm. It's bitter, it's painful. And, but I think in order to really know that, you have to experience it. And that's where some real growth comes in. And leadership is also about being able to recognize, hey, this may not be the right place for me, but I can take those incredible lessons learned and maybe modify my approach and really grow and change the way I did this in this organization so that I don't meet the same mistakes or pitfalls that I found in the next one. But I think what you bring up there is kind of that that interesting struggle too, because we, we all know that as leaders, there are some people that are just incredibly easy for me to manage for. They're just very comfortable. We have similar senses of humor and personalities and love of games. And it's just like, yeah. like the stress of that is, is non-existent. And then there are others where I really, they are so different than my natural state that it takes me a whole lot more intention and sort of energy to, to reach them the right way. And as you said, sometimes though, when you got those connections, they're going to be some of your most valuable members, right? Because they, oh, yeah. once they're in, there's the trust, there's that different perspective. And understanding when it's that and when it's just like, nope, I, this is not, that's not it. This is not that thing, right? <laughs> this isn't it. the right. thing where it's just like, because there is, I mean, you can see a place where it's too much for you and for them, right? You may never feel there, but also it's not going to feed you if you always have to be that way. No, that's so right. And frankly, if they're not successful, how can you be successful, right? Yeah. The whole goal is to help people grow and, and meet them where they are and got to nurture their success based on their skill sets or where they want to go. But if they, if that we can't meet them and there's that disconnect, then they can't experience success and therefore you can't. And yeah. so it's, it's a really interesting dynamic. <laughs> yes. Yes, for sure. Okay. One of the, we're going to switch topics a little bit because one Let's of the go. things I wanted to talk to you about is I think in ed tech, as sort of education has evolved so much, as technology has evolved, we've seen lots of changes in the big players. We've seen lots of acquisitions. We've seen a lot of things. And I think one of the places that you've got a lot of experience and that there is a lot in that space is partnerships, mm -hmm. right? And, and I think it's an area, and you and I have talked briefly about this, that I feel like understanding partnerships, understanding the opportunities for partnerships and determining like, is this a good opportunity or not? And how to leverage it. I think it is a muscle that isn't very strong in a lot of product people. I think a lot of product people are like, we can solve it, right? And they've got, you know, their development partners are like, yes, we can. And like, 
off they go and everything else just feels like pressure because it's different and then it's outside of our source. But I think when we can really harness partnerships, we have the opportunity to, to really sort of leap forward in some cases. And also if we have a partnership that's bad, we don't leap forward, we drop mm. like a big piece. Yes. <laughs> so I would love to, to talk to you a little bit about partnerships, the kinds of partnerships you've seen and sort of, the, of how you think about exploring them in your roles. Absolutely. And so when we talk about partnerships, a couple of things come to mind, right? But I feel like the approach to how we figure out is this right or not, I think is a very similar system. I, mm. I think it's a similar framework, right? So some partnerships might look like this. We have an opportunity to build out a new, if we're talking about ed tech, a new solution that we really need some creative ways to deliver assessments. We have to make sure we are including DE&I. I know there's a new acronym. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mess it up right now, so I'm not going to try it. We have to make sure that we include, you know, multiple ways that students can use our system. And we've never built an assessment engine in the past. So we look at our core competencies, we look at our budget, we look at what we're ready and prepared for. We look at the business strategy, right? What is our strategic narrative going forward for the next, you know, three to five years? And we look at whether or not this is something that would be feasible and our product outcomes or goals align to it. If we say, yeah, we want to, you know, we really do want to build out uh, this new solution with these diverse assessment types, but we don't really have the budget or the core competency to do it. So how would we go about it? Well, let's go and see if anybody else could do it better, faster, cheaper. And it would behoove us to leverage that kind of partnership, right? It's a fully baked product. We can integrate with it. It might serve our need. So that's one way. Another way is when we look at our development cycle and say, okay, we know that we have this core competency and we have the intellectual property and creativity and know-how internally, but we don't have the capacity mm -hmm. to scale. How would we think about partnerships in that way? And that may be we either, you know, hire external to the organization through contract partnership or through, you know, vendors or partners who have, do have the same core competency perhaps, but our intellectual property and ideation and strategic thinking and our plans. So what we want to deliver, we just don't have, you know, the people power to do it. We yep. would then hire a partner to follow our lead and go from there. But a third type of partnership, I think, is how do we partner with other existing organizations that do something somewhat adjacent to what we're doing, mm -hmm. but we don't do it ourselves? And for us to be able to build out an entire solution, ecosystem, marketing strategy, go to market, et cetera, it would take us three to five years and it would be cost prohibitive because it is in, in an adjacent market, not necessarily in our core market. And I think this is where things get very interesting. There are ways to grow the business, right? There's organic growth and then there's inorganic growth. Inorganic growth obviously includes things like acquisition. Hmm. Similar to acquisition is partnerships where you might have a shared or a singular sales organization, right? There might be a reseller and you have a revenue, a shared revenue model. That might be a great avenue. The framework for making those decisions is very similar to any other framework you would consider when you're looking at how do we expand? How do we gain in the white space? How do we gain market share? How do we enter in adjacent markets? The framework for the decision-making in my experience is similar. It's what are our core competencies? Well, first of all, it's what are the strategic goals, right? What are, where do we need to be in three to five years? What are our product goals? What are our core competencies? Is this something we think we are ready and prepared to do? And listen, I'm going to tell you what, this is something that I really think product folks and businesses miss, and it's very detrimental. The readiness and preparedness for the organization to take on a new initiative, whether it is through resale partnerships, acquisition, entering into adjacent markets, et cetera. And when I say ready and preparedness, I don't just mean the ideation and the planning and the, the thought process about what we would do. I'm talking about the execution thought process before we ever sign on the dotted line. Is our technology ready? Do we have the skill sets of the people that we need? What are the skills that we need to be successful, right? It's similar to an efficacy model when you go to 
to start this idea of a new course or a new product you want to build to market. It's the same thing for an organization. Are we ready and prepared to take this on? And I think sometimes organizations really miss that step yeah. because you might have some really strong leadership, but you don't have the systems set up and ready to execute. But in terms of a partnership of a, like a reseller, I think it's a really interesting model, right? You have somebody else who owns and builds out the development and that's their core competency, right? We might have a sales team, a combined sales team who knows how to get to market and, and really sell. And then we have a revenue share. In order to be ready and prepare, there has to be skill set on the team, knows how to collaborate, knows how to talk mm-hmm. about product road mapping, the strategy, making sure that they're aligned. When the customer feedback comes in, what are the channels? How do we handle it? Moving into portfolio management, what does that mean when you don't actually own the business, when you have influence? So those are the types of things that I think we need to be able to think about. And there are strong opportunities to do things like that in market, especially with these smaller startup businesses and tech that are growing and may not know how to scale. But the number one thing I think is often missed is that readiness and preparedness. I think that's super smart because I I agree with you when I think about whether or not I should do a partnership. I should think about it just like we think about with the framework, right? Like, what is the market problem we have? You know, is there a a sizable enough market that we're going to solve it? How does that fit with the market we already own? Where, like, is this something that's in our core competency or we partner? Like the same decisions that you would make to some degree about whether or not you should do it internally, help you understand Mm -hmm. if that partnership is going to bring the type of value and impact that would go. But I do think there's that other piece. It's very easy to make it like in your head. You're like, but that's a, it'll be really easy because we have a partner doing it. Like it's magic. Like there is no resource. And I think it's easy to forget whether you're finding a partner who's going to do development work for you or you're going to find a reseller partner or you're looking at acquisition. There is an enormous amount of time and investment required to set up that relationship and to maintain that relationship. And you have to be honest and transparent about that because if if you don't have it, even if everything else is a great fit, if you're not prepared, if you don't have the resources and you're not ready, it can't succeed. Yeah, that's a great point. And, you know, getting aligned into not just what are we doing and why, why is this to a mutual benefit, but then getting into the how, and that's harder. And it's like stopping a team from doing the work when they know that the process isn't working and it's arduous and painful and getting convincing them that it's okay to stop for a second and really think through what are we doing and how can we make small incremental improvements to make your, our lives easier, right? It's the same thing when we're going into a major initiative like this, which is we really need to get clarity on what are the systems we are going to create in order for us to be successful. I did pull up this James Clear quote, which is one of my favorites. You do not rise to the level of your goals. You fall to the level of your systems. Mm. It could not be more true, right? We have to be able to think about this. And it doesn't have to be gold-plated and, you know, oh, we have to wait a year because the system isn't set up. No, it's really about knowing together as a unit that we have to create a system in order for us to be successful. And that goes back to the readiness and preparedness. If we are not ready and prepared to fully execute on a systematic way, then we have to really be asking ourselves, is this really the next best thing? Because it could end up being time cost prohibitive to the business because we didn't think through how to set up the system initially. Well, I think that's a really good point because one thing you and I have talked about as well is that sometimes, I mean, I think partnership is a muscle that product people need to develop because I think there's good opportunity. I've also been in the product role and I'm I'm certain you have where the partnership was, we'll call it thrust upon us or passionately, you know, broad. (laughs) Your P firm is like, I think we should acquire something. Or, you know, your CEO is like, I met this guy and together we can do amazing things. And I think in that case, part of your product team's role then is to ask the right questions, right? Not to look like a roadblock. But if this was to happen, how would you help your team flush that out and see if it's the right partner and if we're in fact ready and able to take it? That's great. So... (laughs) I would say first is going back to that leadership piece is really understanding. And when I think team, in this particular case, I'm thinking the executive team or the decision-making team, Mm -hmm. right? And I'm thinking we're peers and I have to be real clear on where our rapport stands as myself as a leader in the organization. I always go back to that locus of control. 
what control do I have? What influence I have? And where do I have no control at all? And so obviously as a product executive or product leader, you want to be able to come to the table with the information that you need in order to be heard. Sometimes it's style. Sometimes it's less data, more high level storytelling. Sometimes it's less storytelling, more data, and really knowing your audience and knowing who you are working with and the way in which they will receive information best. Sometimes it's strategic partnership with another human on the team to say Mm. that you know you have a good relationship with and say, hey, I think they're going to hear this from me better, but I think they're going to hear this from you better and maybe tag team that. These are just kind of ways to, to kind of manage personalities, right? But then as a product team, you know, our opportunity, and I used to be the queen of saying no. And I realized that in some cases, saying no is fine, depending on who you're talking to. But sometimes it's actually not yet. Or it's, have you considered, right? Mm. And so the opportunity is to gather the data and the information about, you know, the market, about the adjacent market, about, you know, where are we the most primed into what to move into. I've been at two companies now that have done these glorious studies about what's the white space in certain areas and certain regions. And then they look at the business. I love this. I love it when people can do it for you because good Lord, we know if I mm-hmm. was in charge in the research, that would not happen. So um, alone. So I love partnering these amazing organizations that go and do this gorgeous analysis of the market. Where's the white space? Who's in the white space? Who's doing well? Who's not doing well? And then they look at you and your organization and say, okay, If you're here, maybe going into this adjacent market, like for English language learners, may not be the best fit because it will take you three years or five years to Mm. get there and it's not your core competency. But maybe, and I've had this experience in the past, you know, you will do really well in this credit recovery space and you have academy work. You clearly have the content curriculum and the technology ecosystem that is ripe for blended learning. Mm. Right. And so you look at that white space, you look at who's there, you look at, you know, how could you, what could you do in the smallest increment to deliver something that you could test? Right. So those are the types of things we think about, talk about, but it's gathering that information and whether you have to do it yourself or partnering with another, a third party to bring that information in house and then putting the numbers together that says, what would it take? What the level of effort? What is the cost? If we're doing this as a priority, what are we not doing? It yep. comes off the table, right? And then that's where partnerships might be very interesting. It could be a development partnership. It could be an asset acquisition where you don't, may, maybe there are folks who are ready to retire, but they have this great, incredible system that's a family-run business and they're ready to go and they just want to sell their platform or their technology or their content even. Cool. Maybe it is partnering with another company that doesn't want to sell, but we could resell and they need help in the sales department but we don't want to have to do the development work. So that's where it gets very interesting because, and that upfront work of knowing exactly what you're looking for, what would be the best next thing, mark, you know, company fit and market fit and start to work through, okay, if we wanted to do this, here are the three options team. Here's what the research we've done. Here are three options. Here's the relative cost of these and here's a potential return. And then let the team make the decision about how we go forward. Yeah. No, I like that a lot. If we think about the opposite, right? So there's the opportunity was thrust upon us and we must explore it. And how do we, how do we do that in a positive way? Right. So that like you you did ask that and I just skirted you all the way over to, (laughs) we're going to do the things. Yeah. Yeah. So if if it's thrust upon you, (laughs) well, it's tough. I mean, I've really been there and it really wasn't successful. (laughs) Well, what did so you learn my friend. in retrospect, right? And again, I mean, I've, I've been there too. <laughs> yeah. It's rich I shouldn't the question say that. harder. I shouldn't say it isn't as successful as, it, successful as it could be if it were something that the team had been able to buy into and prepare for in advance. Mm. I'll just say that. Let's yeah. do that. All right. Okay, great. And we have the opportunity that was unexpected for us to take on a partnership, whether it be through a development partnership or even an acquisition. The number one thing is to execute on the integration piece. Now, Mm -hmm. sometimes the integration could just be a systems integration. Sometimes it's both people and systems integration. And I think what is missed a lot is is having the opportunity or prioritizing the overall plan of because we're bringing this acquisition in or bringing this partnership in even, 
It's really understanding how are we going to integrate. And by the way, it doesn't matter if it's an acquisition, a partnership for a reseller, or even a development partner. You have to take the time to understand each other. You have to understand who are you? Hmm. What do you bring to the table? What skill sets do we need? And who are the people that have the skill sets to execute? We have to look at when we're going to integrate people or systems or processes or workflows, I I guess I should say. We have to look at who will do that best, in what way, in what time frame. And the one thing that I think is really, really key is ownership. Who owns what? Mm. Because ownership does not mean I do all the things. Ownership means I facilitate movement toward this goal and it is mine to execute on. I need to gather information. I need to make sure that I have enough information to make decisions. When I am leading toward a decision, I need to go to the right people to say, okay, I'm leading toward this decision. What are the risks? And it, it's the development framework, but just by another name, right? And so I think convincing the organization that if we're going to go through this acquisition, that might be a surprise. We need to take the time to really look at the plan. How do we execute on the plan? What skill sets do we need? Who fills those skill sets and who owns what? And then hopefully the tools, the resources, the technology, the, you know, whatever it is that you need in order to be able to do that is there at best, or, you know, and allowed to be purchased at worst. And you can begin to execute on that. But then it's also a priority conversation and it's a, it's a capacity conversation because you can't do it all. You right. have to say, okay, if we're going to do this, what comes off the table? That's always, so, but that's always a conversation. I just always make it an assumption. No, and I think it's a good one to remember because that really is, I mean, that is the crux of what we have to do. There is never a shortage of opportunities. There is never a shortage of ideas or things we could pursue. One of the things that I think makes a product manager really successful is to be able to have those priority conversations regularly and what feels like a healthy manner for all involved, where it doesn't just feel like, but I'm already drowning, right? And if I add one more thing or find which one of these other things don't you care about, which is maybe what you're thinking inside and not (laughs) undefensively, right? Like, I I know, I mean, you might be like, oh, sure. Yeah, no, I don't. But that is, and part of that is to set up that structure and that process when it's not a tension point, right? When it's not a moment of panic or it's not just well, this is the first time we're having it and happens to be my baby that you're saying no to. And that's, that's, that's going to be hard, right? But it is hard because we want to say yes to everything, right? Except for the really bad ideas. But, but you know <laughs> what I mean? Like there is, a, there is an aspect of how do I build in a culture of regularly being able to talk about what we're saying yes to and what we're saying not yet to and to be able to have those sort of healthy conversations so on a regular basis. No, I love it. And if that's the ecosystem and that's the culture of, you know, there's there's sometimes a culture of, you know, oh, positivity and let's all get along and all that's beautiful and wonderful. Mm -hmm. But sometimes we forget how to teach people how to have healthy conflict. Yep. And if there is a culture of ideation and bringing all the things to the table and really like combing through what's possible And then being able to provide clarity by by using data, you know, whether it's customer data or market data or positioning or, in fact, budget, like to bring bring the budget to the table and say, this is a great idea. And yeah, we would love to be able to do this next, but we don't have the budget right now to do this. This one may have to be over here. If you have a, and I think on the executive level, they are the example, right? And I've done it really well. And I've done it really poorly, when you don't set the example of that healthy conflict and allow people to see the team tackle, right, tackle a major issue or a major initiative and really comb through and make those hard decisions, then they don't feel potentially like they can do it themselves. Like the the rest of the organization doesn't feel like they can do it themselves. Or how, if you can't do it with your team, team members, how then can you expect the people who work for you and next to you also do it, right? You can't teach mm-hmm. them because you can't be the model. Right. Right. You yep. can't, uh, oftentimes I joke and say, well, do as I say and not as I do. And not so much, right? We have to be the model and we have to figure out how we nudge it together. And I mean, I've been with teams who are very, we're very capable of having, you know, spirited conversations, 
but the next day come back and we hug it out and we say, oh, okay, fine. you know, or we'll, we'll kind of work through a compromise or we'll say, you know what, you were right. I think we can manage this first, but we have to agree of what comes off the list kind of a thing. And it's, it's very much personalities. It's ma- very much managing your emotions. Sometimes I'm good, sometimes not so good. So it's very much being able to work through how to solve that problem together, even when it's intense. And that's the trust piece. <laughs> you have to build the trust first to be able to do that. And you, if you're right. If you, I think you said this a little bit back. If you put the system in place and it's there and it's agreed upon and people have been able to work within the system, when the intense and, and, you know, conversations show up and you have that spirited conflict or that healthy conflict, you can fall back on your system. It's kind mm-hmm. of like your mattress, right? It's your comfort level. It's, it's what's there to protect you. And, you know, it's, it's really hard to build, but when you do, Ooh, it is a thing of beauty. It's right. Good. I mean, when you, when you have that kind of healthy conflict, I, I truly think, and we, you hear this all the time, but it, it, you feel it when you're there, it gives us oh, the yeah. best results, right? If everybody just do what I, the boss wants at the moment, it may feel delightful because that was easy, but that's it. Like that we are limited by, by my thinking and we're not bringing in the different perspectives and, and it's, it's when we can have the conflict and really go back and forth, right? Have open dialogue is when we end up with the best solution. And I think as leaders, it's to your point, it's demonstrating that, which also means that, you know, be able to not only to be able to admit, but or to recognize, but to then to like say out loud, you're right, that idea I just had is not as important as these other items. Let's table that we can look at it again. Yeah, absolutely. And the more you can step outside of your own line of what you're doing and be able to see and hear what other people are doing, whether it's in front of a customer or listening in on a customer success call or whatever that is, standing in with marketing at a conference and really seeing and learning about how they operate and they are able to see how you operate. That also breeds a sense of understanding where they're coming from. So when you do have to make those difficult decisions with each other, you know, you're, you, you're saying that you've already been working on, you may think it's the most important thing in the world, but if you know this person is bringing the right data to the table and they've done the work and the legwork to show this may really be, or this is the next logical thing. Yeah. We got to put our egos aside and say, okay, you know, you have the data, you have the proof is where you have it. And, and we forge ahead. But again, trust and respect for one another is, is so key. What's so so interesting too, is we've talked about a bunch of different things where we talked about leadership. We've talked about partnerships. We talk about prioritization. And all of them, I think, goes back to sort of what you, you talk about, sort of the, the first principle that you try to be too, which is people first. All of those are made easier, better, more capable by being people first in our inner area and all of those relationships and building those up. When we combine that, right, with, it, with data, then that's really where you're going to be able to knock down walls and see success in a really powerful way. Absolutely. Always go back to the people. Always. Yeah. Always go back to the people, but, you know, bring data. <laughs> Can you write the numbers? What's, that's a great qualitative piece. Where's the quantitative piece? That's a great story. Yeah. I'm like, Can I right. see the numbers, please? Yeah. Absolutely. But that combination, because just having the numbers, we've done that. I bet every single person listening to this has done that one. So you're like, I showed them the numbers. <laughs> and it's like, they didn't believe them. Or they were just like, and so we're going to do this anyway. Right? It really is the combination of those two pieces together that is how we get to have the biggest impact and the most influence. Absolutely. All right. So I'm going to have you back some time to dig deep in on analytics because I know it is another area that you are very passionate about. I am. It's it's kind of a big deal, especially (laughs) in today's world. (laughs) Yes. Right. And I make, I was, I was not the first time I mentioned this. Like when I was starting my career many moons ago, it was like, I was in market. I was like, oh, if only we had more data. Right. I just wish we had more data. And I'm like, so we got lots of data. Let's make it, you know, information. Let's make it something we can use. Let's make it something that like is powerful, that helps us determine what actions to do. I love it. Awesome. All right. We did talk about a lot of different things today, Josie. If you were going to have everybody do two things differently tomorrow based on what we talked about today, what would you do? I would say build a rapport people first. And P.S., that's not just your internal teams. That's with customers, Mm. customer centric, customer, customer, customer. So people first. And the second thing I would say is 
if you build the systems, if mm-hmm. you build the workflows or the frameworks and you, that you get to a point where people trust those frameworks, even when you make a mistake, you have your framework to fall back on. So take the time to be ready and prepared for your next thing. Excellent. All right. I very much appreciate you joining us today and for sharing your experience and your insights and your passion for all things, both product and education. I loved being here, Rebecca. Thank you so much. All right. That does it for today's episode. Thank you everyone for listening. And don't forget to join us next week when we tackle another great topic designed to help you elevate your product, your company, and your career.